He's been faithful. Jeremiah chapter 1, if you would stand with me for the reading of God's Word this morning. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay this morning. We'll put it up on the screen for you. Then the Word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, ordained you as a prophet to the nations. And then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Now, God, I'm asking you over your word this morning that it would go forth and bear fruit. God, this morning that our ears would be open, that we would hear what the Spirit would have us to hear. That, God, I'd be a conduit for you to move through this morning. God, you'd remove distractions and help us. Just as you said to the churches in Revelation, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So we are in a series titled Divine Assignments. We are looking at what God has to say about the assignments that he gives to us. The first message in this series, we talked about the encounter that Joshua had with God. Joshua had just led the Israelites across the Jordan River. Joshua is encamped in Gilgal. They are about to do battle with Jericho. Joshua has broke camp, and he is out, and he is looking probably trying to get a game plan, a battle plan. How are we going to overthrow this city that has such high walls? I remind you that the Israelites may have had some swords. They may have had a bow and arrow or two. They may have had some shields. But to be able to overthrow a city that had huge gates, that had huge walls, this was going to be a tall task. And if you're the leader in charge, you've got to have a plan. Joshua is out, most likely, trying to figure this out. <clears throat> and he encounters a man with a sword. The Bible tells us that when he encounters that man, Joshua says to the man, Are you for us or are you for our enemies? The Bible records that the man said, Neither. I am the commander of the army of the Lord, and I have now come. What was he saying? I have come to take over. I'm not on your side, and I'm not on their side, but as the commander of the army of the Lord, I am here. What did Joshua do? He fell face down, and he said to God, what message do you have for your servant? And I began by talking to you. I'm not here to tell you what your assignment is. But I am here to encourage you how you respond when God gives an assignment. Like Joshua, we get before the Lord and we say, what message do you have for me? When God has a message, friends, it's not a suggestion. He didn't come to say, I'm here to help you fulfill your dreams. I'm here to help you do this. I'm here to help you do that. He said, I'm here to take over and I've got a message for you. Our response is like Joshua, humble. We are a servant before God Almighty. One of our greatest mistakes is to think I'm God. And he's not. But when God speaks, he's not doing so just to give you a suggestion on what you might want to do. That's the first thing you need to remember about your divine assignment is that God's not suggesting you should do this. God is giving us a command. And last week, as we dove into this particular text, I talked to you about the call. God is calling you. God is calling me. But often we can see the call for those that stand up on the platform 
a lot easier than you can see the call in your life. You can see that God has given Pastor Dusty a divine assignment, but you fail to see that God has given you a divine assignment. And we built on that idea that God has called you and is calling to you. Not only is that he is calling out for you to respond. We looked at the call that before Jeremiah was ever born, God knew him, which spoke of relationship. So when God gives you an assignment, he doesn't send you out on your own. He comes and brings you into a relationship with him, and he sends you out with God. God is not the puppy on the string. Come on. God is not following me around. Whatever Dusty wants to do, I do it in the name of God. If Dusty wants to go here, I do it in the name of God. No. God is calling you to a relationship. He saves us, and he sends us. And so we see in the text, the Hebrew language, he knew you. That God had a relationship that was more than just intellectual understanding about who you were. But the language communicates relationship, intimacy with you. And we talk about this as not only is there a call that he calls out to you. Not only is he calling you to a relationship, but he, God, says the assignment that he gives you brings value to your life. So assignments point to value. This is why we believe and we, we, we believe in the sanctity of the womb. We believe, as my wife has committed and she is the executive director of Care Pregnancy Center, we are pro-life because we believe that every child matters. We believe that every life matters. We believe that even before you were born, God knew you and had a purpose for you. God was calling you, not just when you got it all together, church. God called you before you had it together. God called you before you ever took a breath. As Chantal said this morning, he knows the end. He knew he had a purpose. And assignments, come on, they point to value in our lives. And then we saw in our text that often after God speaks to you and he's talking to you about what he wants you to do, you begin to make excuses. As soon as he speaks, you try to push it away. Ah, oh, you know, I think that was just my own voice or God really, that was, he wasn't asking me to do that or I don't think, you know, surely he's not asking me to do that because what does your Bible say? Jeremiah said, ah, but I can't speak. I'm too young. Oh, I don't know enough. I get tongue-tied. Or you know what? I don't have enough time. Or that's going to require some money. Or that's going to require this. Or that's going to require that. I'm going to have to give up some stuff to do that. And what do we do? We begin to make excuses, and we downplay the assignment that God is giving to you because you don't think or want or whatever it could be. And so we stay doing what we've been doing not following the message that the Lord has for us this morning. God has an assignment for you. I want you to hear that this morning. And so we have entitled this message in last week's Discovering My Assignment. Would you say it with me this morning? Discovering My Assignment. Because you're going to find that the discovery of your divine assignment is progressive. And when I say progressive, it's going to unfold as you take steps. You never take them alone. But as I reminded you last week, he who is faithful in the little things, what happens next? He'll make you what? Ruler over bigger things. What I tell you? If you're not faithful with $5, you probably won't be faithful with 50 And if you're not faithful with 50 you probably won't be faithful with 500 So if I can't be faithful standing and greeting, if I can't be faithful serving here, if I can't be faithful stacking chairs, if I can't be faithful helping to clean up, you're probably not going to be faithful with this huge ministry that's going to be in front of people. God develops you progressively, and he gives it to you piece by piece. How about I remind you of this one? The Bible says somewhere, I know I read it, you walk by what? Faith and not by faith. You probably don't see it all. You probably don't understand it all. Because if you did, it wouldn't require faith. So by faith, you respond to the message the Lord has given you. 
God knew all your mess ups. God knew all your shortcomings. God knew that you're going to drop the ball a few times. God knew you and him were going to have to back up and punt. You weren't going to get it in the first three downs. So you had to back up and punt. He knew that. But in spite of all of that, God still had an assignment for you. You weren't disqualified because you fumbled. You weren't disqualified because you didn't get it right the first time. But there was purpose in the pain. There was purpose in the failure. And God doesn't waste anything. So discovering your divine assignment, I hope you're with me and hearing this this morning, it is progressive. Now I want to talk to you this morning as we get into this message about cultural influences. So if you're taking notes, you're going to want to write that word down, cultural influences. Because how we think about our assignment and the call of God is often conditioned by the culture around you. Now, for us, we live in the States, so we have a Western mindset. And so my mind and your mind is inundated with the consumer mentality. So consumerism conditions us to think a certain way. It gets deeply embedded in my subconscious. So we think about things in terms of options, Often we think about how does this make me happier? How does this make me better? How does this make me more successful? Consumerism centers around me. You have a product, and you think about how that product is going to make my life better. Consumerism says, I've got options. I don't know if you eat cereal, if you don't. But if you've ever went to Walmart and walked down the cereal aisle, you will see that you have options. If you've ever gone to buy a car, the first thing they're going to do is talk about all the options. Your mind is conditioned to think more options equals better. So the more it has, the better it is. And so you think you need more of this and more of that. And if you have more of this and more of that, it'll do what? It'll make you happier? Surely it's going to make me better, and surely then that equals I'm more successful. Bigger house, nicer car, you know what? That's the better life. And so this consumerism begins to drive home this idea of individual choice. I've got a choice to buy this car or that car. I've got a choice to go to this church or that church. I've got a choice to show up on Sunday or watch online. I've got a choice to buy this cereal or that cereal. I've got a choice to wear this pair of shoes or that pair of shoes. You with me this morning? Consumerism drives deep into our conscious, deep into our mind, the emphasis on my choice. So you say, what does that matter, Pastor Dusty? How does that affect my divine assignment? Well, when God begins to speak, we begin to say things like, how's this going to affect my family? How's this going to affect my future? And so we begin to look for assignments from God that center around us and not obedience to the word. I've got this much time. I've got this much money. I've got this. I've got that. And so then I can do this for God. And it had nothing to do with the message God gave you. Shall I remind you that God's not interested in how much you got. God's interested in what you do with what you got. God doesn't need all of Israel. God can take Gideon and 300 to do what God wants to do. God's looking not for all of your abilities. He's looking for your availability. He's looking for you to come to God and say, here I am, Lord, send me. But when we have been conditioned with our Western mindset, the consumerism, we want to know questions like, how's this going to affect my family? How's this going to affect my future? How does my time fit into this? My resources fit into all of this? And we walk away from saying, God, what are you speaking to me? We don't get a word from the Lord. We're not listening for the call of God on our life. We're just looking for what I can do in and of my natural abilities. But you forget when you surrender all of your ability to God, he will magnify it tenfold because he starts you out doing the little things and he develops you and shapes you. It's like going to the gym. You don't go to the gym and start bench pressing 300 pounds. 
you start out with a little bit of weight on there. And the more you can do that and you've increased it and you went through the whole regimen of, of strengthening your body, strengthening your triceps, think strengthening your, 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 your chest muscles, you do all this, then eventually you work your way up to that. But you can't bypa- bypass the process. But what happens is you look and say, well, I've only got this amount. Amount of time, amount of money, amount of energy, amount, and we base it off of this and not that. Come on, you with me this morning? And many of us have ignored the call because it did not present the opportunities that I would have liked for it to present to me. But I want you to hear this this morning. Assignments are often not about you. Assignments are often not about you. Assignments are about advancing the kingdom of God. If you've made this world your home, then you're not the pilgrim passing through. If heaven's your home, then there's a passing through. There's I'm on a mission. Oh, there's that word. Because we are called to mission. Not just the missionaries, but you and I, as I've been talking about, are called to mission. We have to be a missional church. And missions doesn't mean I come to service and that's my mission and my assignment to God. You come in here, you get a word from the Lord, and you go and you do what God has called you to do. We are missional in our focus. The Great Commission is about mission. Go therefore and make disciples. But it's about going, not just sitting. And so often assignments are not about us, but assignments are about God. Assignments are about advancing the kingdom of God. But the cultural influence in our lives often confuses the call. And I'm going to say it again just for the sake of it. So you're conditioned to think in terms of better, happier, and successful. And so when it comes to the call of God on your life, you start looking at the options in your life. Well, how much is that going to pay me? How much can you pay me? What are the benefit packages that come with it? What options or opportunities? Are there room for advancement here? Now, don't get me wrong. I am not downplaying those things, and those things are important. But you get a word from God before you start worrying about that. Because I say this over and over again. Where his presence is, there his provision will be. Where his presence is, there his provision will be. And there's nothing wrong with those things, but it's not the starting place. Your assignment always starts with a word from God. The assignment came to Joshua. The assignment came to Moses. The assignment came to Paul. It has always started, come on, hear me, with a word from God. God. All of the options, benefits, how good will this be for my family? All of this will be great. But when tough times come, when it gets difficult, when nothing seems to be going right, when some of the people you thought were going to be this and some of the people you thought were going to be that, when transitions start happening, all of those things won't keep you. You can be making all the money in the world, but if God didn't give you the assignment, something's going to be missing. Something's going, and all that money ain't going to make it for you. That's why we have so many that have climbed the corporate ladder and they've got to the top thinking there was going to be something there and they arrived and it was nothing like they thought it was going to be. You get a word from the Lord, and you stick to the word. Because when it gets difficult, when it gets overwhelming, you go back to what did God say to me? I'm doing what I'm doing because God spoke to me, not my neighbor spoke to me, not because it had a good benefit package. You're not going over there because it was good over there, or going over there because it was good there, or I'm going to take this job because I'm going to make the most money there. You need to get with God because he calls and he speaks and he's still speaking today. God, what do you want for me and my family? I want to be, what we say, in the center of God's will. God, what's your assignment 
for me. If Jeremiah didn't have a word from the Lord when he was thrown into the cistern, when he was left to die, when everybody was turning against him, when he would go and give a word and it wasn't received well, when he was abused, when he was isolated, when he didn't have any friends, you know what he stood on? Not his benefit package. Not his room for advancement. No. He had a word from the Lord. He was on a divine assignment. And when you get a word from the Lord, the Bible says in the book of Jeremiah that his word was shut up in my bones like a fire and I couldn't hold it back I had to speak it because he had a word from God do you got a word from God this morning is God speaking to you are we listening for God are you shutting in with God to listen for what he has you don't have to worry about whether you're supposed to go or whether you're supposed to do this God will move you when you need to move. God will do what he needs to do. You just stay obedient to the call. If God gives you a message, be obedient to the message. Be obedient to the message. Peter, standing in the the boat with the rest of the disciples. Jesus comes walking on water. What did he say? Lord, if that's you, give me a word. Give me a word. Jesus said, come. Come. What did Peter do? He listened. But what happened after he came? The storms, the waves, all of that chit-chat on the side, all of this happened, and he forgot about the Word, and he forgot about Jesus, and he forgot who was worthy to be lifted up for just a brief second because you are going to experience stuff in life. But God always gives you a word for what you're facing. James said that any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. The context was this. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith will produce patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. He will give you a word when you are in the midst of your diverse trial. He will never leave you alone. Some of us say, you know what, the the teacher's always quiet during a test. I say, baloney. I got the word of God. He's always speaking to me. My teacher knows where I'm at. If I'm in the midst of the trouble, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because God spoke to me. He spoke to me and gave me a word. If it's dark around me, I'll ask the light to come in and shine in my heart. God speaks. He does. But sometimes it's like Elijah found out. It's just the still, small voice. The still, small voice. Assignments will also bring fulfillment. They bring fulfillment. If they're going to point to my value, and I find value in it, you will find your greatest fulfillment doing what God has called you to do. Psalm 37, 4 through 5, the New Living Translation. You're very familiar with this passage, but let me read it to you. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. It begins by delighting yourself in the Lord. Make Jesus number one. Make Jesus the center. Make Jesus why you do what you do. Make Jesus why you go where you go. Not your benefits package. Not, oh, how good is this going to be here? How good is this going to be there? If it's just a little better here, there's probably going to be a little something better over there. But you're asking God for the word. And assignments will bring fulfillment. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. Listen to what verse 5 says. Commit some of those things in your life to the Lord. Oh. (laughs) Commit your way to to the Lord. Trust also in him. Commit everything to the Lord. When Joshua fell face down before that for the Lord, he was committing everything to the Lord. He didn't just say, you know what, this is what I got. He said, here I am, Lord. The same way that Isaiah did. Here I am, Lord, send me. And I'm encouraging us this morning that when you begin to get your assignment from God, you will realize that it brings Fulfillment. I'm going to talk about that a little deeper here in just a second. But I said a minute ago that assignments are not just about us, okay? Assignments advance the kingdom of God. Because assignments are meant to fix things. God gives you an assignment 
to fix things in this world that we live in. He wants to better this world, that the kingdom of God would be here. Your will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. He wants the will of God here in this world. Jesus said that the kingdom of God was advancing. You get an assignment for God, and you are a part of something bigger than yourself. It's bigger than you. It's bigger than me and my family. But I'm a part of something that is grand. I'm a part of something that is eternal. I'm a part of something that has value. I'm a part of something that brings fulfillment to my life. And what is that? You are advancing the kingdom of God. And ultimately what we see happening is that we are reversing the effects of the fall. So what do you mean, Pastor Dusty, by the effects of the fall? When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, it changed everything. They were living in a place of being dependent on God. And they made an independent decision to trust their own ways. God has called you and I to live in a relationship dependent on him. But you and I battle with being independent the autonomy about me, my effort, my way. And so when we do this, God is calling us to come back into a dependent relationship with him and reverse the effects of sin when men have gone this way, when men have gone that way. And so my assignment is designed to solve problems, to see the kingdom of God manifested in the world that we live in. God's called you to solve problems how many of you have ever ran out of gas somewhere? Have you ever needed somebody to, to push you? Yeah, I, I've, I've been there before. It's been a long time since I've been there. I don't like getting too close down there anymore. Sometimes the assignment is so simple that you just need somebody to help fix your problem. I've got to get to a gas station. And you know how valuable it is when a few people come along and want to push your car somewhere, to even if it's just get out of traffic, even just get into the gas station. It's valuable. You meant something to that person in that moment. And that's just a little thing. But when we begin to look at the problems in the world, there are physical problems, hunger problems, shelter problems, emotional problems, mental problems, sin problems. And God has called so many of us to be involved in reversing the effect of what sin has done to this. And you are a person who brings a solution, fixes a problem, meets a need. And so we do this because it brings fulfillment when we do that. You know how good you feel when you do something good for someone? You, you feel good. You feel a sense of fulfillment because you are a part of what God is calling us to do in the big picture of problem solving. So I remind you of this. Your assignment points to value. You think, I don't have any value. Let me tell you something. The world needs you. The world needs you. If God said, before I formed Jeremiah, I knew him, that means before he formed you, he knew you. If God had a plan for Jeremiah, God's got a plan for you. And he wants you to be a part of advancing the kingdom of God. But here's what I've learned about this. Often, many of us are not fulfilled because we're not doing what God has called us to do. We don't experience that fulfillment because we bounce around from this thing or that next thing. And so we're searching here, we're searching there, we search for it in this relationship, we search for it in that relationship, we search for it in this job, we search for it in that job, we try this church, we try that church, and ultimately we're looking in the wrong places. Now, God will have you go to this job, and God will have you to go to that job. God will have you come visit this church, and God will have you come visit that church. And, and I'm not minimizing it. I'm saying there's a source that's greater than the job. There's a source that's greater than the church. And when you find that place and you get plugged in and you're obedient to the word, you're obedient to the call, God does something internally that is spiritual and supernatural. But what happens is, is that many of us begin to experience burnout and frustration because you're doing things you weren't called to do. Sometimes people don't listen 
when God's called them to do something. So you saw a gap, and you, you went to fill in, and it was meant to be something temporary, and you had to get there and stay there a little longer. And you got frustrated or, or you struggled with it because you were trying to make up for somebody's lack. Come on, some of you have been there. People make excuses and they, don't, they walk away from the word of the Lord. And so others have to step in. And so what should have just been a temporary feel became something lasting. Next thing I see in our text when I look at it is there's this idea of what I said in the first message, whom he appoints... He anoints. Look at our text. But the Lord said to me, do not say these things. I am a youth, for you shall not go, for you shall go to all to whom I send you. And whatever I command you, God was going to give him a word. And then in verse 9 he says, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. When God appoints you, he anoints you. The anointing is the enablement to do what you couldn't do yourself. It's the God factor. And God's going to give you things that are beyond your means. Because if you can do it without God, you know what you're going to do, right? You're going to do it without God. So God's going to give you more than you can handle so you can learn to trust him through it. When God appoints you, you need to remember he commanded him to go. When he appoints you, he anoints you. But the appointment is not a suggestion. He was commanded to go to the nations. God's going to do it in your life. You're going to begin to recognize this in two ways. We call it the inward and the outward. You're going to begin to experience something inward. and We call it the inward call of God. Something God's doing in your heart, stirring in your heart. God's speaking to me. I'm not quite sure what that is. I don't really know exactly what I'm supposed to do. But inwardly, you start experiencing something. I can remember that when I was in Teen Challenge, I'd only been in the program for a couple of months. I didn't know anything about ministry. I didn't know anything about a call of God. But I sensed something on the inside that God was calling me to do something. And it seemed like it had to do with teaching the Word of God and encouraging the Word of God. I just didn't know what that was going to look like. But outwardly, I began to experience other people recognize that. So it wasn't just what was happening on the inside. There was the outward confirmation to what God was doing internally. And he began to send people to me to encourage them with the word. And I didn't even really know what was happening. I just sensed something inwardly that was being confirmed outwardly. And then it began to develop into being here at Gateway Church. And that was some 16, 17 years ago. So when I talk about it being progressive, I didn't know exactly what was happening. But I sensed something internally that was beginning to be confirmed outwardly. I'm going to invite our worship team to join me on the platform. As you're discovering your assignment, and I talk about this thing that God's doing in you, and you're sensing something. You know, some of those questions you're going to want to ask yourself, what do you love? I'm not talking about food necessarily, but like, what do you really love? When you do this thing, it makes me feel like this. What, what do you really love? What's your passion? When you do something like this, how does it give you that valued feeling? What thing or thoughts keep coming back to you? What keeps coming back to you? Maybe that thing or thought that keeps coming back to you is how the Lord is trying to speak to you with this particular thing that God has for you to do. Why does that keep coming back to me? Why does this thought keep coming to me? But what about this one? What do you hate What really gets you? What angers you? What maybe keeps you up at night? When you see this happen in your community, it angers you. You hate seeing this kind of behavior. What is it? My wife... 
can talk for hours about the things she does. When it comes to the abuse of women, when these women are in a crisis and they feel like they've got nowhere to turn from abortion, it, she feels something. She understands certain things about what they're going through. It motivates her and compels her because she hates to see abuse. She hates to see children abused. It angers her when she sees this thing. And when she's in that element, when she's in that moment of speaking to that woman that's broken and she feels like she's got nowhere else to turn but to an abort a baby, the value and the fill, fulfillment comes because she's speaking life. This was progressive. But she can go all the way back to when she was in high school before she ever knew that God was going to put her in the pro-life ministry, that she wrote an article in her high school in New York City about pro-life. And she didn't know back then it was progressive. God developed it. And He developed so many other areas of her life. Now mind you, that started before she ever took a breath. In New York City, God was birthing something in her that he would do in Shreveport, Louisiana. Geographical location doesn't determine where God's going to use you. Age doesn't determine if God will use you. But as you're discovering this, you're looking, what do I love? What do I feel valued when I'm doing this? What thing, thought keeps coming back to me? When I do this, I feel like this. When I see this in my community, I can't stand it. Somebody needs to do something about that. Maybe that somebody is you. Maybe when you look around the church and you're like, this needs to be done or that needs to be done. Maybe God let you see it because he wants you to fix it. Assignments make the world better. Assignments fix problems. But you start with the little things. Maybe you just saw a light out in the church. Maybe you just saw an area that needed to be touched up with paint. Maybe you just saw that they needed somebody to help out here. Maybe you saw there weren't enough greeters. Or maybe you saw they needed this. And God put your eyes on it because he wanted you to do something about it. Maybe you saw there wasn't enough money to take care of fixing this. But maybe God's speaking to you because he wants you to give to make it happen. Those are all divine assignments. Is there something that maybe brings you to tears, tears in your eyes when you read it? You're scrolling through your Facebook feed and you see this particular thing and you're like, you got to click on it. And when you begin to read it, you feel something stirring on the inside. See, there's power in pain. There's power in emotions. Divine assignments can also or often be discovered by understanding my passion, the things that move me, but also my pain. And I close with this point here. When I read this particular verse to you, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, your mind will go back to the story. Joseph said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position, assignment. God gave Joseph an assignment, and it just may seem like he sure used a weird way of getting him there. I mean, you would have thought he could have done a lot of things in the pit, to the prison, to the palace. Doesn't necessarily seem like the most advantageous way to put you into your divine assignment. But all I know is somehow he used my jail cell to get me to where I'm at today. God can use our pain. He brought me to this position, Joseph said. Why? Look at it. So I could save the lives of many people. 
Assignments advance the kingdom. Assignments fix problems to save many people. But I can assure you that if God, come on, work with me on this one. If God would have told Joseph, here's your assignment, and here's how you're going to get there. Your brothers are going to try to kill you. They're going to throw you down in a ditch, and they're going to stand above it trying to figure out this scheme to tell your dad about how you died. They're going to leave you for dead. They're going to change their mind. No, they're going to sell you as a slave. They're going to get a little bit of money from you. You're going to be hauled off to a foreign land. You're going to be a slave. You're going to work in Potiphar's house. You're going to seem some, like you're going to have some success. In the moment you seem like you're getting some success, somebody else is going to betray you. Somebody else is going to have a scheme against you. You're going to be thrown in prison. Back in prison you go. You're going to sit there for a while. You're going to see other people get out, but you're going to stay. Doesn't sound like the pay scale he wanted to get. Doesn't sound like the benefits package that he was looking for. Didn't seem like the options for advancement that he was looking for. It didn't seem like that would be best for his family because how many years did he go without even seeing his father? His brothers. Betrayal. Alone. No friends. No family. Isolated. See, sometimes God doesn't give it all because you can't handle it all. He's just looking for us to stay obedient. But when God gives you an assignment, church, it's going to make the world a better place. What I find in that little verse there is that the trauma that you experience oftentimes will fuel your assignment. What you've gone through, God will use it to fuel your assignment. What I found in my own personal life is what God brings me through, He intends to use to help others. I can't tell you how many people over the last 17 years have come to me and talked about, wow, your testimony, wow, your story. I get messages on social media all the time. People I don't even know, never even met face to face. I just had one this weekend. I've been watching your story from afar. Wow. Your story gives me hope. The trauma that you've been through, God's not going to waste it. Because you know what's going to happen? You're going to understand it like nobody else can understand it. Because you've walked through it. You've been there. It's, you're not standing off telling somebody else's story. It's your story. You've been through it. Maybe you've been through a divorce. Maybe you're a single parent. Maybe you've experienced abuse. Maybe it was in a marriage, but maybe it was when you were a child. Maybe it was sexual abuse. Maybe it was drugs and alcohol. Maybe it was a wound in a church. Maybe that trauma that you thought was to break you, God used it to make you. Not that he brought it on your life, but he doesn't waste your pain. And anything that you give to God, God will use it to bring glory this morning. And you will find such value in that. And you'll be thankful that you could encourage somebody else along the way. And the verse I close this with, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. Come on. He comforted you through it. He brought you through it. You may not have thought you were going to come through it. Joseph may not have thought he was going to come through it, but what the enemy intended for evil, God used it to bring life and liberty and freedom and value in your life and purpose in your life and fulfillment in your life. And what didn't make sense then is beginning to give you a little bit of condolence because you're getting through it. You're encouraging others. When they are troubled, God's going to use it. 
God's going to use you. He's got an assignment for your pain. He's got an assignment for your struggle. You keep going because your test is going to be a testimony. And when it's tested, you're going to testify. And you're going to find such value and significance in where you're at now. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Friends, you've got an assignment this morning. He'll use everything. Everything. He don't waste anything. Paul ends by saying we are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort that God gives us. I said it a second ago. You may not see it, but he's still working. You may not feel it, but he's still working. You may not understand it, but he's still working. You may wish it were over right now, but you can't get there without going through here. You can't get there without going through here. And I promise when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he'll be right there walking with you. Would you stand with me this morning? What I'd like to ask you this morning is that you'd be willing to give that pain, trauma, whatever it's been. There's nobody in this room that's not experienced something. Everybody has experienced something. And what I'm encouraging us to do this morning is that you'd give God all that you've been through. Ask Him how He may use that in your life to be that comfort to somebody else. And the worship team's going to sing worthy because He's worthy of it. Would you just bow your heads or if you want to come to the altar, you can come to the altar. If you want to kneel down at your chair, you can kneel down. But I'm asking you to give it away this morning. We say that God is trustworthy and we say it because He's worthy of our trust. You may need to just let it go this morning give it to God. You may be right in the midst of it this morning, but I'm going to ask you to give it to God. I'm going to ask you to trust. Trust this morning that right where you're at, God's got an assignment for you. And it's not defined by your pain. It's not defined by your past. And I hope you hear that this morning. Thank you for watching today's message. I hope it blessed and encouraged you. Click like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And let me encourage you, consider giving to support the ministries of Gateway Church. You can do that by texting 77977 and then put GW Shreve in the text box. Also, download our app in the App Store, Gateway Church Shreveport. Share this with your friends and we'll look forward to seeing you next week.